Inde man er på det til i et spil, det er sang, de er manden. Today we have the feast of Saint Edward the Confessor. He's one of the very few English kings also to be a saint. Um, actually, the other saint king of England was his uncle, uh, Edmund the Martyr. So I, mean, I guess it runs in the family. Uh, but uh, Edward the Confessor, he was born in the year 1003 uh, to the English king Ethelred and his mother Emma of Normandy. And this was a time when England is in um, quite a bit of flux. There's the uh, lords of Sussex and Wessex uh, in, in the south, and then there's the Danes invading, and then there was the, the, the you know the, the indigenous people still, the Picts and the the, the Celts, and uh, so England is not a solid country at this point yet. It's it's very fractured, um, and so the Danes invaded, um, making an unstable situation more unstable. That was in 1013, and Edward was just a boy of 10 years old. So he ends up going into uh, Normandy, uh, northern France, and pretty much spending um, uh, uh, the next 25 years in exile. Uh, various, you know, his father goes to England, his father flees, his father goes back, his mother goes to England, she comes back, his brother is killed, his father dies, somebody else gets the... It, it was it's this, this mess of, of uh, um, royal intrigues. Um, uh, young Edward, however, uh, just doesn't care. Uh, he's in Normandy, and um, you know he goes on hunting trips, but he also goes to monasteries, goes to convents, and over time he becomes more and more uh, pious, spends more time in prayer, uh, spends more time conversing uh, not with the other noblemen of court, but with uh, uh, holy men and women. Interestingly, two people that he grew up with, uh, one of them was named Robert the Devil, and the other one was William the Bastard. So. That's, uh, you know, that, those are the people he grew up with. So uh, the nicknames were, I guess, more uh, pointed back then. Um, so uh, this is his childhood, not only his childhood, but as a young man and even as a, a fully grown man. Uh, Edward was for, would be 40 years old, still living in Normandy in exile. And as it turns out, um, in the year 1042, after all the political goings on and people dying and being killed and so on, uh, Edward ends up the next person in line for the throne of England. And so he's called in uh, by the English lords and they crown him king against all his expectations and even really against all his desires. Um, he'd said before that um, if, uh, if he had to gain a kingdom by bloodshed and wars, he'd rather not be a king at all. Uh, so that was his disposition. And um, let's see, where is it? This is, we, we read in the uh, Butler's Lives of the Saints has a good entry about that, is that uh, St. Edward was nursed in the wholesome school of adversity, the mistress of all virtues to those who make a right use of it. And uh, that was the case. Is it wasn't easy being in exile, being, and he was pressured too uh, at various times to come and take part in these things. He, he was still pressured to do that and he wouldn't do it. He, he would resist. Uh, but he, as, as he lived as a young man, and a grown man, he would live as a king. He attended math, mass with devotion. He prayed uh, very often. He was completely uninterested in the usual uh, allurements of court. Uh, his disposition, uh, as we are told, was modest and gentle. He was slow to anger, generous to the poor, and charitable towards all. And the best virtue that a king can have for ruling is true humility and a lack of ambition. And both of these were possessed by our good King Edward. And so uh, he came to rule England with all of these virtues and all of these dispositions. He did so without malice, without deceit, without political schemings. And his kingdom enjoyed peace for the next uh, 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 about 25 years. And he didn't, he didn't rely on an army. They told him when he, when he came to the throne, okay, you've got the Danes across the sea, you've got some of these rebellious lords in the south, you've got you know, rumblings there in Normandy, um, you know, you need to, and you've got the Scots to the north. You need to, you need to make sure you have a strong army to be able to protect and defend your kingdom. And so what did King Edward do? They told him, okay, you need, you need to raise taxes, you know, have this revenue, spend it on the army. Uh, King Edward did the opposite. Not only did he not raise taxes, he abolished taxes. He got rid of them. Um, he uh, didn't spend his money on the army. He spent it on the poor. He rebuilt churches. He rebuilt the roads. The countryside had been devastated by like 40 years of, of conflict. He, uh, he rebuilt it all. He helped the people. Um, and it said that he loved nothing more to do than to spend all the money he had on the people who needed it most. 
And his idea, especially with taxes, was why should I give money back to the people when I could just not take it from them in the first place? All right, so that, that, that was the, the, the um, idea behind King Edward. And um, again, against all worldly expectations, uh, his kingdom uh, was completely at peace. Um, yeah, maybe we've heard of that, that um, uh, terrible, awful author, Machiavelli, who wrote that book, the, the Prince, designed about how to gain and keep power. And Machiavelli says one of the things is, it's much better to be feared uh, than to be loved. I think there's a certain amount of truth in this, but with King Edward, he kind of had both. Is, as the people loved him so much, they feared to lose him. And so everybody, the Danes, uh, the, the people of England, uh, the, they all loved the, the, uh, King Edward. They, everybody wanted him to, to, to remain the king. Uh, he, in fact, he became known as um, the, they called him the father of orphans and father of the poor. Now, to this, he added, uh, um, I would say, these virtues were preserved by his chastity in that he took a vow of virginity and he remained so his whole life. And so as a king, however, he was pressured to, uh, to marry, to, to, to uh, take a queen, to produce an heir to the throne, and he couldn't overcome the insistence of the nobles that he take a wife, and so he did. Uh, but um, this is the cleverness of the saints. He convinced her to take a vow of virginity also, so he was safe. And so for the rest, of the, the rest of their lives, they never had any children, and they both died avowing that they had lived in complete continence uh, their whole lives. And again, he attended Mass frequently, sometimes two or three times in a day, and it was said he was gifted with visions of Christ at Mass. He would see Christ in the, in the Eucharist or have visions of the, of the Christ child. And um, there's one particular story uh, while he was at Mass uh, displaying how to those who seek first the kingdom of God, he gives them all things besides. And this is exactly what happened to King Edward, is that he was attending mass, and uh, well, previously, uh, the, the, the Danish king, uh, you know, they did, people don't stop scheming, right, in these other kingdoms. So the Danish king uh, finally decides, uh, it's one of, the, one of the successors, like his father had been king of England and he should be king of England. So he's planning an invasion uh, of, of England. And King Edward is informed of this. You know, your navy is not up to speed and your army, you need to be bigger. You need to prepare for this invasion. And what did King uh, Edward do? He kept going to mass, right? He kept praying and doing what he was accustomed to doing. And so one day at mass, uh, the king is in prayer and uh, he starts laughing to himself. Like, it was very unusual for him. And so the nobles are wondering what, what, what this means. So they ask him after mass, what were you laughing about? And he said, oh, um, well, uh, the Lord showed me a vision that while the king of, Den of uh, um, the Swedes uh, was embarking upon his vessel to come and invade England, he slipped off the, um, the plank and fell into the water and drowned. So there's not going to be any invasion. And sure enough, a short time later, they found out this is exactly true on exactly that date at exactly that time. That is when the Danish king had drowned. And so... Uh, we see how God cares and watches over those, uh, right, the righteous, ev even in their sleep, right? We, do, we don't need to be taking all these crazy measures. So that was the piety of King Edward. And there was actually, there's one military excursion he undertook, and that was to restore Malcolm III to his throne in Scotland. And this, um, uh, uh, how we could say that, that drama, that's what King Shakespeare wrote about in Macbeth. Macbeth had killed Malcolm's father, Duncan, and then Malcolm III was exiled, and it was King Edward the Confessor who fought against Macbeth and restored uh, Malcolm to his throne in Scotland, which would be very providential, for Malcolm III would end up married to uh, St. Margaret of Scotland. Uh, and she would do for uh, Scotland what King Edward was doing there in England, building churches, monasteries, reforming the people's lives, reforming the clergy, and so on. So we see how the saints, they, uh, they support each other. So uh, in return to God, this has been, this has been going on for, 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 for two decades now, over two decades, and in, in, in returning thanks to God for peace in his kingdom, uh, King Edward wanted to make a pilgrimage to visit the bones of St. Peter. He'd made this vow early on, if God would grant peace to his kingdom, he would, do, he would take this pilgrimage. And so now towards, um, you know, after 20 years, uh, he was going to do that, going to fulfill his pilgrimage. Uh, well, the people were very distraught. They didn't want King Edward to leave, and so they besought him to stay with it, with tears, actually. And so he writes the Pope, what, what should I do? I wanted to make this pilgrimage. What, what, what can I do instead? And the Pope tells him, um, stay there in England, and instead of, of, of traveling here to Rome to visit the bones of St. Peter, 
uh, spend the money you would have on the journey, rebuild a, a church or an abbey or something, and dedicate it to St. Peter. So this is what King Edward does. He finds this old monastery, it's in ruins, he rebuilds it, he dedicates it to St. Peter, and we know that this, uh, this abbey now is called Westminster, Westminster Abbey. This is where um, all the kings of England have been buried for a thousand years, and it was King Edward who restored it and dedicated it. And he himself, uh, shortly after completing that project, uh, would be the first king to be buried there, uh, thus starting um, uh, that dynasty, right, that, that tradition of the English kings, even today, that they follow. Uh, so he himself would die in the year uh, 1066, and that was just a few months later. Uh, that younger um, uh, uh, man in the court there, William, now had the surname William the Conqueror. He would come uh, to England and, and take over the throne. And to show the, the veneration he had for Edward, he had his tomb encased in gold and silver out of respect for what Edward had done for England. Uh, in the year 1102, uh, 35 years later, the body of King Edward was exhumed and it was found to be incorrupt. His limbs are still flexible, uh, the, his clothes were still fresh, and there was a sweet uh, smell, uh, an odor coming from his tomb. A cripple recovered the use of his legs after praying at his tomb, and six blind men received their sight after visiting King Edward's tomb and praying. And so Pope Alexander III canonized him in 1161, and that was just under 100 years after his death. Uh, thus the legacy of King Edward, which still continues. Um, and compare that, right? Compare what we've heard about the reign of King Edward with perhaps other kings in history, uh, the Pharaoh in Egypt, right? Or King Herod in, in, uh, in, in uh, the Holy Land, how they went to great efforts, murdering children, uh, enslaving whole nations, trying to keep on to power, trying to hold on to their wealth, trying to hold on to whatever it was they had in their own minds, right? And Pharaoh destroyed his people by his stubbornness. He would not let the slaves go, right? Herod, like I said, w w was murdering children just to try to hang on to the chance that his, his kingdom might not be taken by somebody else. And where are they now, right? Where is Pharaoh? Where is Herod? I don't think they're in a very good place, right? But where is King St. Edward? He's with the blessed, right? He's with the blessed in the kingdom of his father, right? Come ye, my blessed, to the kingdom I have prepared for you. Sit ye at my right hand. For a thousand years, King Edward has been enjoying the fruits of his earthly life. Uh, the generosity, the kindness, the charity, the love of Christ, and that joy will never end. Uh, compare that to so many people who are miserable in this life because they just can never secure the power they want. They're always afraid. They're always wrangling. They're always upset. They never have enough money. They never have enough power. And then they die and they're in misery for eternity, right? That's what's placed before us. And we see that today, even in our own country, all the political wranglings going on. I'm gonna let us pray to King St. Edward, right? For peace in our own souls, for pursuing not, not the, the petty pleasures and powers that are before us, uh, but to pursue the kingdom of God. And let us ask also for his intercession uh, for those in our own, in our own country, uh, that they might seek uh, goodness and truth and seek God uh, rather than power and pleasure first. And God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.